Good morning, everybody. Welcome to our Kirsten Bosch Wednesday talk, um, brought to you by Room to Grow, Sandby, and Straight Nature. Um, just before we get started, I'd like to just thank our sponsors. We've got Straight Nature, and Straight Nature is the leading specialist natural history publisher in Southern Africa, associated with the best selling and most highly regarded field guides in the region. Straight Nature publishes full color illustrated books across a variety of subjects including birds, mammals, reptiles, trees and flowers, the marine environment, geology, astronomy, and general wildlife, as well as children's nature. Um, Room to Grow. My name is Brett. I'm the owner of Room to Grow. Um, we're an exterior design and project management company that's been designing and creating outdoor living spaces in and around Cape Town since 2002. We offer a complete suite of landscape design, construction, maintenance and associated exterior design elements to our residential, commercial and retail clients. And you can find out a bit more about us at uh, roomtogrow.co.za or follow us on our socials, Facebook and Instagram. And then today, there's my pleasure to introduce Professor, uh, Professor Crystal Tolley. Uh, she's a research leader at the Leslie Hill Molecular Ecology Laboratory at the South African uh, National Biodiversity Institute. She has worked on chameleons since coming to South Africa in 2001 and has spent many hours studying chameleons in the field and even more time in the DNA lab, uncovering the secrets of their evolution, relationships and taxonomy. Her book, Chameleons of Southern Africa, came about because people had so many questions about chameleons that needed answering. These included how many babies they have, how to tell male and females apart, what they eat, among many others. Also, amazingly, she had seen that there was no readily available book on the natural history of chameleons. And Crystal has recently described three new chameleon species, one of which is restricted to the Hrodfadersbos forest. So today we're going to be looking forward to um, discussing bringing new species to life, the discovery of the Hrodfadersbos chameleon. As normal, we'd ask if you have any questions, you can please put them into the Q&A section and uh, we'll deal with them after the talk. Uh, thank you, Crystal. Over to you. Okay, th thanks, Brett, and also thanks a lot to Belinda for um, getting me here and convincing me that um, I should give one of the, the Wednesday talks. Um, I think she's been trying to get me um, to do this for a little bit, uh, for a few months already. So we had a spot opening and I took the gap, I guess you could say. And um, Brett is correct in that there is a book on chameleons, but it, I have to admit that it's nearly 20 years out of date. So we're hoping to, to do an update sometime in the next few years. And um, we'll, we'll see how that goes though. Yeah, so this, is, this talk is about chameleons in general, but also featuring the Hrudfordersbos chameleon and how we bring new species to life. So there's a little bit of sort of scientific DNA um, things in it, but not too much. It's more of a general how we go about these things. But before we start that, I'd actually like to just break um, have what I want to call part one about chameleons, because there are, as Brett said, so many questions about chameleons. And of course, not everyone has the book. And if you have the book, maybe you haven't read it <laughs> and you wonder about chameleons anyway. So one of the main uh, things that people often notice that is obvious about chameleons are they, they, have, they have the two big features. They have these rotating independent eyes that can go in all directions. And they have these gripping hands that allows them to move through the vegetation and grip onto the branches. But those to me are really, so, so chameleons are lizards and, and these are actually two features that sets them apart from other lizards, geckos and skinks and such things. They don't have these independently rotating eyes and they don't have these grasping hands. So chameleons are a bit special, but there's many other things and I don't even really think much about their eyes or their hands. I think more about the, the other features that set them apart or make them special. Um, so just about chameleons in general. There are over 200 species now described of chameleons. They only occur in the continent of Africa and on the island of Madagascar in natural populations. There are some um, introduced populations in other places though. But we have quite a few chameleons. Uh, you can see that they're very different, diverse, 
body forms, colors, there's all sorts of chameleons. Well, there's 221 sorts, I suppose you could say. So they come in shapes and sizes that are quite diverse. In South Africa, we have 22 species, but 20 of them, so most of them, are in this dwarf chameleon group. And this is some examples of the dwarf chameleon. So they themselves as a group are also very diverse. You can see the very different features that they have. They occur in different habitats. Um, they're all across South Africa, except the central arid regions. So again, lots of diversity in the chameleons. Now, this is also in terms of diversity, they're creatures both big and small, I'd like to say. So this is one of the biggest chameleons here. You can see it in the hands, it's very big. This isn't the very biggest of all. There's one species that's bigger, but this one occurs in the continent of, of Africa. The other gigantic chameleon, which is only slightly bigger than this one, um, occurs in Madagascar. So this was the one we have on the continent. This is its scientific name, but it's Meller's chameleon. It's not in South Africa, it's from Mozambique up into East Africa. Its body is 30 centimeters long and the tail is another 30 centimeters. So the one there in the hands is actually not even a big one of, of this species. They get bigger than that. So you can imagine 30 centimeters probably is, well, okay, I don't know, <laughs> something like that. So they get very big, but they're also small. So this chameleon is the smallest chameleon. It's only in Madagascar. It's the... Um, uh, Brookesia nana, it's the scientific name. It's one of the world's smallest vertebrates. So there's only one, and I think it's a, a shrew, a mammal that's slightly smaller than this. It's the world's second smallest animal. This is an adult on the finger of a, of a person. Its body is only 13 millimeters long. So one and a half centimeter, not even one and a half centimeters long, the body. And a Panado tablet is actually about the same size as the body of this chameleon. So very, from very big to very small. Again, lots of diversity. It's an amazing group. One of the big things that people wonder about chameleons, but it does seem that people, if you describe what they eat, they, they actually know what they eat. So uh, I'm not sure why this is always a question. Maybe people are just confirming uh, what they think already, but their diet is basically invertebrates and insects. Um, so we have looked at chameleon diet before and we find that they eat mostly flies, grasshoppers, spiders, the list is there, isopods, bugs, beetles, I can rattle it off, but they are um, having eating lots of different things. But I say there that the prey size of chameleons is governed by their body size. So the body size of the chameleon. So very small species like that um, tiny one from Madagascar will only eat obviously very small things like tiny little isopods crawling around under the leaves and things. But big chameleons like that Meller's chameleon or the, um, the, you know, the large size one eats very, they eat very big things obviously. And there are even records of chameleons having having eaten birds and small mammals. So they can <laughs> have a very varied diet and eat even other vertebrates. It's pretty amazing. Although they do more specialize on invertebrates. So tongue projection. Everyone knows the chameleon shoots the tongue out of the mouth to catch the flies, don't they? So um, how does that work? It's actually ballistic. So it doesn't, the tongue isn't coiled up. You know, maybe in the, the cartoons, they would show the chameleon's tongue coiled up and it would roll out. That's not what happens. The, the tongue is um, held at the back of the mouth and it's under a tension. And when the chameleon wants to shoot the tongue out, it will, it's a ballistic action that shoots it out. It's sort of like a, a ballistic, like a bullet leaving a barrel. Um, so it's the same sort of boom that that shoots out the, the tongue based on tension in there. So here's a, a progression of this chameleon um, eating a fly. Uh, yes, so the second slide, the uh, second picture, the chameleon is sort of getting the tongue primed and then it shoots out. And you can see the tongue is very long. They tend to be as long as the body. The tongue has this sort of cartilaginous little ending to it, but this is all fleshy bit. It's 
Um, often people think that the, the end of the tongue is sticky and that's why they pick up the fly. You can just see the fly there on the end of the, the tongue. Um, but that's not really what is the main um, attractant of the fly to the end of the tongue. It is a little bit sticky, I admit that. It's, it's a tiny bit sticky, but the main way the fly sticks is the end is shaped like a suction cup. And that suction cup hits the fly and pulls it into a little pocket that is slightly sticky. And then the, the um, chameleon brings its tongue back in. And that's how they do it. Then they masticate the, the prey. So they don't really chew. They don't have uh, like, like a leopard or something, sort of those teeth that would chew up a, 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 a prey. It, they basically mush it in their mouth and then they swallow it. Uh, the other question that often people wonder about is how do chameleons drink? Do they go to a puddle somewhere and, and drink like a, a mammal would do? And they just, they do not. They would drink the dew from the vegetation. So this chameleon is literally drinking some uh, moisture off this stick here with its tongue. So they sort of lick up moisture and plentiful in the mornings, obviously for them. And so that's probably when they drink the most, if they do for the day, maybe in the evening before they go to sleep. Color change is the other big thing that chameleons um, are famous for. They are one of the few types of animals out there that can change colors, Ma many do octopus and some fishes change color, but chameleons are probably uh, the most famous, I would say, for it. And the one of the main reasons they do it, so again, in cartoons, you know, there's that chameleon whose tongue rolls out <laughs> and rolls back in, which is not true. And then there's the chameleon who turns the checkerboard pattern because they put it against the checkerboard. That's also not true. That's not how they do what they do. Um, the main reason one of the main reasons they, they change colors for communication. They communicate with each other by displaying different colors and then their intention is known. So the um, big one is males versus males. So males will communicate um, through color and they communicate sort of their dominance. So who's dominant, who's not dominant and they, and they um, sort of flash colors at each other <laughs> to show that. So this is a male before he sees another male. And this is the same male after he sees uh, another male who is more dominant than him. So the other male I don't have in the photo, but the other male maintained this and maybe even intensified this um, orange and black and white coloration, whereas the, <laughs> the loser, <laughs> um, his colors went very subdued and the black turns sort of a silvery and he loses the white. So for this particular species. So different species will do this in different ways, but this is a general um, idea that they, they communicate through, through this. The other way is that females will communicate to males um, how they're feeling about that male being around them. So this is a female before she sees the male. She's quite light in color. There's not a lot of patterns to her. And then she sees the male and starts to turn quite contrasting and show some colors. And then lastly, this is her here. You can barely see her. She's turned so dark. That's her mouth gaping at him and she's hissing at him. So this is the male and he doesn't really know what to do. <laughs> should he leave or should he stay? Um, and this is her saying, no, please leave. I don't want you here. So communication is very big for them in terms of color. The other thing they use for color change is to thermoregulate. And that means to adjust their body temperature, which as you know, reptiles, which chameleons are lizards, so they're reptiles, sit out in the sunlight or in the shade to adjust their body temperature. So they have a, chameleons will um, sit in the, the this chameleon is, um, turned very light in color and here it's turned very dark in color. It's because it's adjusting its body temperature. So when they're light in color, they're reflecting the sunlight. And when they're dark in color, they're absorbing the sunlight. So this one here is warming up and this one here is cooling down. And so they have these very intense color changes to do that. The other um, 
reason chameleons change or have color patterns or even change color to some degree is to have these disruptive background not matching the background but <laughs> sort of um exactly like a checkerboard but they do have patterns that help them blend into the background so it's not untrue that they might match a checkerboard of course they would never actually do that they would match pattern match against a gravel plane so this is a desert chameleon from namibia and it's matching its basic coloration is to match the gravel plane um, to to blend in with it and from there it will turn colors when it wants to communicate or thermoregulate this is another chameleon that's um basic color is to blend in with the leaves in the background for these uh, camouflage. And here, if you haven't spotted it yet, is also a chameleon. And this is a master at uh, blending in with the leaves. I'm gonna show you an outline of the chameleon there. It's my sort of attempt at drawing the outline, quite um, not very good drawing there, but that's the chameleon, there's his eye, and then the outline, these are the two, two of the legs and there's the tail. I'm gonna go back so you can look for it. Can you see it now? So it's completely matching the leaves to look like a leaf. Um, and it has turned a little bit of a darkened color in order to do that. So this is an amazing type of um, background matching, but not perfect checkerboard, that's for sure. Um, oh, okay, right. And so you might be thinking, oh, but those are all very drab chameleons. What about the brightly colored ones? How do they match? The background and they actually can do this as well even with their basic colors. So here are two very brightly colored species and they match perfectly um, the the leaves that they they can blend in perfectly and this is more of a disruptive type of patterning. So here's a tiger walking through the grass and if that tiger were not in the grass it wouldn't be uh, it would be quite visible but in the grasses it's it's blending right in because it's got this disruptive coloration or disruptive patterns and that's what the chameleons have so these two chameleons are i have to admit put on a branch in such a way so that they can be visible in the photograph for you know purposes of being an artistic photo but would that chameleon go into those leaves you will lose sight of it in no time because of the disruptive coloration so even the bright chameleons um, do blend in easily with the background. Everyone asks, well, how do they change color? And I am no physiologist, that's for sure. But so I, um, but I thought I would pop in this slide because it's always a question on how they do it. Uh, this is about my, the level of my understanding on this. They have specialized layers of pigment cells in their skin that are packed with organized reflective crystals. So there's these specialized cells called chromatophores or more specifically iridophores. And those things have these crystals that are reflect the sunlight. And those crystals are, uh, this, this is a diagram from a scientific paper that I could barely understand, I admit. <laughs> and so here's the chameleon skin, very detailed, but you can't see the individual cells here for sure. You only see the little bumps all over the skin. Those aren't cells, those are just the dermal layer. So this is now a diagram going down into the skin, the top being the epidermis, EP. And as you go down into the skin, there are different layers there. And these layers, there's a little arrow showing the crystals in those layers, in those um, cells. And then the organization of those crystals, sort of, <laughs> your understanding is as good as mine on this, um, that they sort of organize in different ways in order to reflect the sunlight back in different ways at different wavelengths and therefore colors. So that's the technical explanation of how they do it. Just a little bit on chameleon behavior in general. They are loners, so they don't like other chameleons. And you saw that female trying to drive off the male earlier. So they, they're not fond of others. <laughs> I guess you could say they don't play well with others. Um, they move around a lot to thermoregulate. So when they're walking through the branches, you may have seen chameleons doing this they're most likely trying to adjust their body temperature. Males, however, we do know that at least in some species, the males follow the females around, hoping to get the opportunity to mate. So they do this kind of following. And if you see two chameleons on the same bush, 
it may be a female and a male where the male has been following her. Females though, they're not particularly tolerant of males. So that female that was driving that male off, that's very, it's a very aggressive display and scary. <laughs> so they just don't want, they only will allow a male near them if they um, will, uh, they agree sort of to be made it. So they don't like it. <laughs> Um, reproduction in general. So uh, as I said, the males follow the females around, but first they may need to drive off other males and they'll do that through the signaling that we talked about already, the coloration changes. So the dominant male kind of gets to stay where he is and the, the, the loser male um, will have to slink away with his colors uh, subdued. If they cannot resolve their differences through the coloration, the signaling through colors, they may escalate to a fight. So the male, one male may not back down from the other. And so they'll have to uh, approach each other and start fighting. And here's some fighting chameleons. These two are biting each other. Um, eventually one of them should fall and get dislodged from the branch. These are horned chameleons from Kenya, Tanzania rather. And they are also Kenya, actually, um, and they are fighting. They lock their horns and they do it in such a way that one chameleon eventually gets flipped over and falls off the branch. So they're trying. the one is trying to flip the other off the branch so that he can remain. There are also, this chameleon isn't fighting, but the, there are many species. This, this is just to show you the diversity of different horns that chameleons, some species have. So these are blade horned, blade horned chameleons and they do lock them together and fight um, to dislodge each other. Sometimes, as I said here, these chameleons are biting each other um, and it, they can have very serious bites that result in quite bad injuries actually. So it's nothing to be trifled with. <laughs> Um, and as I mentioned, the males will guard the females waiting for the opportunity to mate. So he will have to signal to the other males that this is his female, please go away through his um, coloration or he'll have to fight. Females choose to mate or not most of the time. Sometimes males ignore all warnings and they will attempt to mate the, the female anyway. But here is a female warning on the, on the uh, right, warning this male on the left to go away. She doesn't want him there. So you can see this aggressive display again, the scary display. He looks quite scared if you ask me as well. Okay, so what else? Oh, reproduction, how many babies do they have is a very um, common question. So most species of chameleons, most lay eggs and they can lay 30 to 50 eggs. They'll dig a hole in the ground. They deposit the eggs in there and they'll cover them up. And then a few months later, the babies will dig themselves out of well hatch out of the egg and then dig themselves out of the nest. This chameleon here is a female and you can see all the bumps all over her. Those are eggs inside of her. So she's heavily um, gravid and the eggs, she will have to soon deposit those eggs somewhere in the ground. Some species though, give live birth and they will have 10 to 20 babies in the clutch. So this is a, a species that a, a chameleon that has given live birth to these babies here. There's, I don't know how many there, but there are probably more hanging around. Um, the female is still here, but she won't stay. She will, leave. she's probably just getting her bearings after giving birth to all of these babies, um, sort of resting a bit and then she'll, she'll leave. When the babies come out, they come out uh, um, in these tiny individual clear sacks and they have to sort of push their way out of the sack, break it open, the sacks, the chameleon, the female deposits the sack on the leaves and then the, the baby has to push its way out, break its own way out, and she she goes away. So um, all of the dwarf chameleons that are in South Africa have live babies. So they live birth. The babies, yeah, they're about 20 millimeters long, so very small, that's in body size. And again, they, I said already, there's no parental care. The babies are perfectly able to survive on their own, often, People ask if they should do something if they've seen baby chameleons. They you don't don't need to do anything. They they're able to to from the moment they push themselves out of that sack, they're able to walk around and feed and do what they need to do. 
Okay, so that was part one. As I mentioned, there's a couple of parts in, in this. The next part, so I, I um uh, that was just about chameleons. Now this is how we bring new species to life, <laughs> new chameleons. How do we go about doing it? So um, this graph. Oh, so first, let me go to the to the right side here and just mention that every species you probably know this already gets a genus and a species name. So we have different species of chameleons. And when we name a chameleon, we have to decide what is the genus and what is the species. So I just wanted to mention that very briefly. Um, and those genus and species name, you probably know this as well, have to sort of follow rules and patterns and things. And there are um, committees out there, global committees that decide what are the rules that you have to use to describe a species. But that aside, this is graph shows the number of species of chameleons. So from zero to, well, I said this 221. So the graph just goes a bit beyond that. And this is year. So from 1750, the first chameleon was described. And over the years, we get more and more species of chameleons described until the current situation where we have over 200 described. You can notice, however, that for the first ooh, 100 years, there were very few chameleons described. There weren't more fewer chameleons back then. They were just, we didn't know about them, that's all. Since 1900, the number has gone up quite readily and substantially, but really in the last, since about 2000 is when the number has shot up. So we're getting more and more, the rate is higher over recent years. And there's a reason for that, which I will now go into. But first I want to mention that th there's a couple of, I, I kind of break this down into two categories. And, and let me just go back here. So initially we had to discover the species. We had to go out into the wild and find the animals and say, oh, here's a new species. So that's kind of just new discoveries, things that we've never seen before. We didn't know were there and we have to, we, when we find them, we can describe them. These new discoveries still happen. You can imagine that back in the old days, they happened often because many parts of the world were not e explored. But believe it or not, there are still places on this planet where there are a few people, hard to get to places, very inaccessible, that are unexplored. And this is a trip we had to Mozambique in the mountains of Mozambique, getting into this forest, which we could see from Google Earth, by the way. So we knew there was a forest there. And we wanted to get in there to look for new species. And lo and behold, in that forest, we did find a new species of chameleon. Um, we know what group it belongs to, so what genus it belongs to, but we haven't described it this is my bad, actually, I haven't done it yet, just given it a name. So it's still considered SP and it has to get a name still. But that's a very new discovery. Nobody knew it was there. They, you know, there are um, local people who live down off the mountain and they didn't know it was there either. So yeah, new discoveries are one thing. But then there are what I like to call the legacy species. So these are things that we knew were there we just didn't quite know what they were or what to do with them. So this is a species that was recently described, but before it had been described, we knew that it occurred in the Eastern Koha Mountains in the Eastern Cape. We knew it was there in this sort of very remote mountains. It's hard to get the bucky up there. It's a long walk, but we did know it was there because people have been there. We knew this thing was there since the 1980s and it only got described last year. So it's been lingering, it's a legacy species. We had, had to have some work done on it before we could describe it and nothing had been done. So that's the other type in my sort of categorization. Um, and the way we, in the, in the old days, they brought new species to life, they described them by comparing the morphology between species. And all that means is that you look at the how the species look, the morphology, their body, and you ask what features do they have that differs between them and other species. So you can see four pictures of chameleons here. They are all four different species. 
but you can immediately see that they're not the same. One's got a sh tiny short tail, the others have longer tails. This one has a funny nose to it, the others don't. This one has um, some deep grooves here and some little spikes on it, whereas the others don't have that. So using these features and comparing them and sort of tallying them up for each population, I suppose, out there, we could say, oh, but this population is a new species. It has all of these features that are different than others. So that's really how they had to do it in the old days. But um, things can be very tricky when we use morphology because some species, and you probably know this, look very much alike. And so how do we know that they're different species if they look so similar? And this was one of that, the reasons that chameleon I mentioned that we knew about since the 1980s or 90s, but nothing happened on it was because it looks very similar to another chameleon that lives in a different mountain chain that is separate, the Babianskruf Mountains. And if you look at those two pictures, those chameleons are practically indistinguishable from each other. And we didn't know, are these one species or could they be two? Because they're in two very different uh, mountain, mountainous areas, different as in, you know, they're separate from each other, but the habitats are very similar. And so what's happened here is we have what is called convergence of the body form. So these two species of chameleons living in this very similar habitat have converged to look the same so that they can blend in with the habitat. So they've, you know, they've got the same features that allow them to be cryptic in those two habitats. And it took some extra special work to try to get these um, described, which I will go into shortly. The other reason morphology can be tricky is because now I'm going to say the opposite. <laughs> I'm sorry if this is going to be confusing, but morphology can also be very diverse within a species. So this is, if you're from the Cape, you may have seen this gecko living on your house. Um, it's the marble leaf toad gecko. And it's a single species. Yet yeah, look at those two pictures. Those two chameleons, uh, chameleons, I'm sorry, geckos, look quite different from each other. So how can they be, if we were to use morphology or at least color patterns, how could we say that they're the same species? So even within a species, we can have a lot of diversity. So we can have two species converging to look the same or within a species, we can have them looking very different. And so how does this really work? I mean, how, sounds wacky, doesn't it? Like how can we do anything if this is the case? <clears throat> so here's, how we have in the last two to three decades been um, using tricks to help us describe species. So this is five pictures of five um, very different looking chameleons. And you might wonder, are they one species? Because you can see there are some features that are similar between them, but they also don't look quite the same. So is it one species? Is it five species? Is it a couple of different ones? This is a map showing where these species, these individuals come from. Um, for those of you that are, I noticed there's a lot of people from different parts of South Africa, so that's fantastic. This is along the south coast um, in the Nisna forest, if you don't recognize the coastline. So Mossel Bay being here, Nisna, George being here. And the green shows where the forest is. And these chameleons come from this um, Nisna forest patch. So they all come from, basically the same larger patch of forest, but they all look very different. So could they not be different species? Then we have the a species, a population of this from over here in the Grootwadersbos, tiny forest patch near Swellendam. And that's a picture of this, the, the chameleon from there. It looks very much like the others. So for years, this is a legacy species. For years, we didn't know what, was it just a isolated population of the Nisna chameleon? Because the Nisna dwarf chameleon is very diverse looking amongst itself even. So what we have to do is take clues from DNA. This is our trick that in the last years we've been using. And I can now confidently assume that everyone has heard of PCR and DNA sequencing since the times of the COVID pandemic, because we all had to go through P 
PCRs and and then they use DNA sequencing as well to um, to do it. And so these are just two lab techniques, which I will not go into, but we use the same exact lab techniques as you've been subject to with COVID testing um, to do PCR. Eventually you get the DNA sequence out and that's a clue for us. So basically we take the DNA sequence, this is a cartoon of a DNA molecule. And once we have the DNA sequences from all of these individuals, we can compare those sequences. And if they're very similar, it's a single species. If it's very different, it's a different species. And that's how we do it. Now, let me just bring you back to COVID. Apologies for that. I know no one wants to hear of it again. Um, but one more time, COVID, because you, if you were very into sort of checking up on COVID, I mean, obviously we all knew about the variant, um, but you may have seen something like this in your um, searches about getting information on COVID. This is a, a tree of the different COVID variants. So the red is a one variant, the orange and yellowy colors are different variants. Then we have the, the blue and the purple, which are other variants. And the way they do this is comparing the DNA sequences, they, they can group them in um, together, the similar ones into this sort of clustering tree. So these red ones are all similar DNA sequences and that's why they're a single variant. The blue is are similar DNA sequences. So that's another variant and that's how it works. And then we can take, what they did was took these different variants and they put them onto a map and you can see where the variants are most common. So they kind of put them all onto this uh, map of the distribution of, of COVID. <laughs> we do the same, for, but for chameleons. <laughs> so we make a tree of all the different species of chameleons. So, so this is all of the dwarf chameleons all into a tree used uh, built, built by looking at DNA sequences. So everything that's together in the tree are more similar species and the further apart ones are more different species, but every tip of the tree here, every branch leading to a teep tip is a different species of chameleons because they're all separate from each other. Then we take our chameleons and we, from the different places, we DNA sequence them and we put them into this tree to see where they go. And what we found out in this case is that all of those from the main Nisna forest patch are this blue spe species here, Bradipodian dameranum. That was a species we already knew about. So they all, everything from this for the big larger forest patch, even though they're very diverse looking, are this single species. They all go into the same place in the tree. However, the chameleon from Hrutvadersbos, so from very much over here in this tiny forest patch, goes onto a different branch in the tree. So it's like a different COVID variant, but it, in this case, it's a different species. So that's basically using the DNA. And because we can do these new technologies, well, they're not that new, we've had them for a couple of decades. Um, that's why we are describing more species now, that graph that I showed you that went shooting up in the last decades is because we're using these techniques to help us get these clues about what to do. Like I said, the Hrut the Vodersbos chameleon was there, we knew about it, we just didn't know if it was another population of the Nisna chameleon until we did the DNA sequencing. So just a, a, one, a couple little things about the um, Hrut Vodersbos chameleon. I forgot what's on this slide. Ah, okay, so this is just <laughs> a couple pictures of it. It's nothing, nothing uh, impressive, just that it's separate. I've kind of said this already, and here's a few pictures of of it. Um, yeah. Oh, and its scientific name is Bradipodian venestum. So um, it's named after Venus, the beautiful goddess, because the chameleon is beautiful and so is the forest itself. There's a picture of the forest. It was the title slide, but also in behind here on the, um, the background. So really it is a very beautiful forest. Um, Okay, and so I said the very first slide, the title said something about bringing species to life, um, the Hrut Vodersbos chameleon and friends. I put that in parentheses because I also want to mention 
the other two chameleons that we, we talked about earlier, the two that live up in those mountains in Feinbos, and we didn't know what they were. And eventually we figured it out um, that they are convergent. They look the same, but they're different species. And in the same exact study where we looked at the uh, Hrutvardersbos chameleon here in pink, we also took the DNA from these other two chameleons and we put them into the same tree to find out if they are actually different species and have a look at where they go. The one goes up in this group, so it's related to these other ones, these colorful ones, but it lives in Feinbos. Whereas this one here in the Bavians Kloof is in a very different place. So it's like the blue COVID variant off by itself, as opposed to the more similar COVID variant. So even though they look very similar, they're both new species um, and the DNA has, has told us that. So luckily we have these um, DNA sequencing technologies that we can use to help us categorize the biodiversity that we have. Okay, so I would say if anyone needs to do their laundry, get back to work, make a coffee, I'm gonna switch now <laughs> to a different uh, part. And this is, this is not a very long section of the talk, but I just wanted to um, go into chameleon conservation for a few minutes. It's very few slides. So if you don't need to do your laundry yet, um, you can hang on a bit. <laughs> so this is part three, the very last part, because people are often concerned that they used to see chameleons in their gardens, but they don't anymore. And why is that the case? Um, well, I would say it's the case because if you look at the left and the right pictures, you'll see the habitats that chameleons want. But the middle picture shows what we humans have um, given them. So we have a planet that's dominated by our infrastructure, by our choices of what the habitat should look like rather than what it does look like naturally. And we are changing things such that they um, struggle to survive in, in our human dominated landscape. And because of that, we have um, looked at the threats on chameleons and we've uncovered the, that 55% of dwarf chameleons so over half of them are threatened with extinction because of their habitat being lost. Um, we, when we do this, we don't just make up something and say, oh, they're threatened. We have a process that we follow. And in that process, we decide which category of these uh, three threatened categories are most suitable by um, evaluating different criteria, how much of their habitat is threatened, um, maybe they're you know, how well they can cope with those threats. So we have a whole load of things that we have to look at um, to, to get their threat status is what it's called. And the risk of extinction is higher with the threat status that's assigned. So chameleons or all species, in fact, that are considered vulnerable have the lowest, they're threatened, but it's not um, as high. We, we don't think they're immediately going to go extinct. Then we have what's in, you've probably heard this word before, endangered, and then we have critically endangered, and the, that's the worst category. So if you're a critically endangered species, there's a real risk of, of becoming extinct. For the Hrut Vodisbos chameleon, it is considered vulnerable. So it's the least of the threatened categories, but we are a little bit worried about it because that forest patch is so small that anything happening to the forest patch, and I must mention that the forest patch is completely in a protected area by, um, it's under Cape Nature. So it is protected, but should something happen to it, this chameleon could rapidly go extinct because the patch is so small. In fact, the patch is just over, just under rather four square kilometers. That's minute, to be honest, for a species. Um, so what can we do to help this situation? <laughs> And so now here comes, and I think Brett will like this part, I hope, <laughs> plant a chameleon friendly garden if you don't have one already. Um, and how can you do that? Well, I would say that the best way is to try to make it the most similar to whatever the natural vegetation is in your area. So for the Cape, that's a lot of fane boss. Um, in the garden route, that's forest patch type vegetation and so on you want plant structure. So you don't want just trees or just shrubs, you want low and high. Um, and there's a specific reason for that. 
um, and which you, because I want to just also mention, you want also big and small branches. So perching sites for chameleons should be big and small. So the low and high, big and small, the reason for that is to allow young chameleons. Remember I said babies can survive completely fine on their own. Well, that's not entirely true if they don't have anywhere to go. So you want to provide good habitat for baby chameleons. Think about how small that baby chameleon's hands and feet are that's grabbing the, um, the perches. Minute. And so you need little places for them to hide with tiny branches, but you also need bigger vegetation for the adults. So you, that's up higher. So you need low and high, big and small. And of course you want as little open grass as possible because a chameleon does nothing with grass. So you're excluding them, them from that habitat. You also want your trees and bushes to connect to each other. So you don't want just a tree and then grass and then another tree. You need the trees to touch and maybe some understory. So you're building habitat for them. So the chameleon friendly garden is the thing um, you also want a compost heap. <laughs> yes, you will get flies, but we already know that's what chameleons eat. So if you want to provide a nice um, food resource for them, you don't want pesticides, a compost heap will help, especially if you plant nice vegetation around it so the chameleons can just hang over and eat from it because like takeaways. Um, and then unnatural predators are not great for chameleons. They will knock down the populations of chameleons, including domestic cats, but other types of unnatural predators. So if you can somehow um, keep them away, that would be, I don't have good recommendations for that. <laughs> so maybe let's not ask, <laughs> um, but think about it. If you can think about it when you're planting your garden. So the advice is think like a chameleon. I need food. I need shelter. Even if I'm a small baby, I need different kind of shelter than the adults. I need that shelter day and night. So not just the daytime. I need to thermoregulate. So I need some sun and shade. So varied veg vegetation. And I need to reproduce. So my babies need a place to go. So you need those tiny things like restios and such for the babies. Um, so I would say if you build it, they will come. And I would not recommend gardens that are bare and barren and, and things with just wood chips, um, but a varied vegetation, this sort of thing with even a, if you have a water feature, that's great because chameleons will hang around it eating the, the insects that come to it. Um, so yeah, Brett, this is, I actually didn't know how well this would feed right into your own uh, business, but there you go. I think um, we just managed <laughs> fantastic. to keep it at 45 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> no, that was that was fantastic. Thank you, Crystal. That was awesome. Thank you so much for sharing your passion and your knowledge with us. Um, we really do appreciate the time you've taken to to put this together and, and as well as coming together and sharing you know your 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 knowledge with us. Um, we do have some questions, uh, so I'll go across to those and we'll we'll answer them, hopefully. Uh, Sharon has asked, when I was a child, there were chameleons ab abounded in the Western Cape. It not, seems no longer to be the case. Philadelphia, Philadelphia has uh, quite a community of chameleons. How does the Hrutfader's boss chameleon differ from those ones we see in the Philadelphia Atlantic coastal area? And I think you've touched on that with the different species as a different it, species. Yeah. yeah. So where are we it's, looking at Species. Yep. Yep. But it is still a dwarf, it is one of the dwarf species. It's correct. Yes. It is is in the bigger group. So it is the same genus, mm -hmm. but it's a different species there. I'm curious. Um yeah, actually we don't get I don't know if she can repost a, 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 a an she, answer, but if it's the it. um the brightly colored one or the, the drab one, because the uh, populations from Cape Town have apparently expanded up toward that area but then there's mm -hmm. also a drab one that occurs naturally on the west coast so hopefully it's the drab one because that's the the more natural one there well sharon if you've got an answer you can add mm. that into us yeah Thank she you. could put it in the chat if she has an answer. perfect um saskia has asked uh, she says that she has observed chameleons in captivity also eating leaves is this just roughage to, roughage to age in to aid in digestion or a considerable part of their diet that is news to me, <laughs> Saskia. <laughs> um, I think if you see it again, get a picture of it. I have no idea. I've never seen a chameleon eating a leaf. Um, yeah, get a picture of it <laughs> if you can. 
<laughs> Perfect. <laughs> There's a challenge. Um, yeah. Elizabeth has asked, how often can chameleons breed and when, like, and how long till they have to, are capable to breed the first time? Okay, so that, that depends on the species. The dwarf chameleons, after about a year or a year and a bit, they can start breeding. Um, and they, depending on how big they are, they, they uh, could have more than one clutch in a year and they can have different sized clutches. So if they're kind of just getting into adulthood and it's their first time breeding, they probably will have fewer babies at once, maybe more in the five to 10 range. But as that female grows and gets bigger, she can have 10 to 20 and she can do that several times a year for the dwarf mm -hmm. chameleons. For other chameleons, if you go into other places in Africa, particularly the egg laying ones, they will only have one clutch a year and usually it kind of times with the season so that it's, yeah. I mean, in tropical Africa, you know, it would be so that the babies emerge when there's food. So let's say during wet season or just after, but I'm not entirely sure of the details of every species. Right, thank you. Um, Roger has asked, what are the predators for chameleons? And I'll just link this to a, a comment by Anne, who was asking, are the hardy dars that have now moved down to the Cape, are they, are they the unnatural predators? Are they eating chameleons also? Good, good questions. And I also see that Sharon has responded, it's the greenish ones in Philadelphia. So those are the ones that have gotten out of Cape Town and are kind of moving north. I think probably human-assisted movement. <laughs> and mm -hmm. they, they may just be in town and in gardens not in the natural vegetation on the west coast so anyway um yeah so predators primarily birds and snakes chameleons are very good at hiding from birds and snakes but they still don't always manage obviously um in terms of snakes the boomslang is a big one for chameleons well known well known predator of chameleons and um for birds all kinds of birds uh, Predator, uh, birds of prey, I suppose, would even eat chameleons. Shrikes are famously uh, chameleon predators. Hardy dars, I think so, but I don't have any actual evidence yet. And they are moving down into the Cape. Oh, they've been here a while. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there was one outside the window when I was talking. <laughs> I thought, oh, but it doesn't make a lot of noise. Um, so, yeah, if anyone sees a hardy dar preying on a chameleon, it would be great to get a photo of that too. Yeah. Right. Uh, Wendy's asked, what uh, samples do you take for the DNA sequencing? Mm, that varies a bit. So sometimes we we are able to get enough DNA cells from taking a swab and putting it in their mouth. Um, and that is um, uh, not, not necessarily the easiest thing to do. If you can imagine a chameleon, it's just kind of fighting and biting you as you're trying to swab inside of its mouth. Um, and those samples tend to be not good quality. We've actually done a study on this. And But the other is the best is to you take a bit off the end of the tail. Some people might think be squeamish about that, but we take such a small amount that it doesn't even bleed or anything and the chameleon doesn't notice it. So that that is a, a much better sample if you really intend to to try to get good quality DNA mm. out. Mm. Right. Uh, Coralise up in the high felt has asked, do they eat less during the winter and in the dry cold of the high felt areas? Yeah, so I, I, I that's a, also a good question. I, I think they tend to be less active. So I have looked both summer and winter in those areas and you find far few chameleons in the winter. Um, the, you know, they, they don't hibernate. Chameleons don't hibernate. They will go into what's called a torpor. So they just kind of re slow down their metabolism and sit somewhere nice, you know, mm -hmm. hiding until, you know, the day maybe most of the week is cold but one day will warm up and then they'll kind of come out that day and move around a bit they need a body temperature of more than 20 degrees to be able to function um, so if it's colder than 20 they're just going to be sitting around and if they can warm up above that they will move mm. i think that answers the question yeah i think it does <laughs> Um, uh, Colin has asked, how do the chameleons judge distance to their prey, seeing as that they don't have stereoscopic vision? Yeah, actually, they uh, that's they have the two 
eyes and when they are going to home in on the prey, both eyes swivel forward so that they would be in stereo at that point. Um, but they focus through, not like our eye, we have a, um, I don't actually know how our eye focuses, <laughs> but I know that's not like our eye. They focus like binoculars. So the lens inside their eye moves in and out like a binocular moving in and out. And that helps them focus, but they would swivel both eyes forward and look with both eyes at the fly or whatever it is. Mm. Um, I must say that when they shoot the tongue, they don't always hit. In fact, it's surprising how many times they don't hit the prey. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Another thing that we've been glad to put, put the comics and the cartoons. Yes. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> Um, Monica has asked, we introduced dwarf chameleons on a reforestation site a few years ago. Can you advise on when is the right time to look for them out on site or can we mon or how can we monitor them? Yeah, if you're going to do any monitoring, you need a, I must say, right up front, you need a research permit from whatever province you're talking about, as well as you need a permit to translocate any chameleons. So they are covered under pr provincial legislation. So you'll have to contact your province. Um, I don't know what province it's in. No, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't say here. Yeah, okay. So that is one thing. And then I would actually work, if the provincial authorities have a scientific services, work with them on a monitoring program. Um, we do monitor chameleons in some cases. And the way we do it is to put a pen ink mark on their belly, just down here. You can't see my belly, but it's here um, with a number. And then we go back and we um, look again to see if we um, can recapture the same individuals. And we have, there's a whole statistical process, I must say, to, to know whether or not your chameleons, um, your, your population is surviving uh, or not. So rather best to coordinate with scientific services of the province and possibly some researchers to make sure it's done properly mm. with that good has, advice. you know, good results. Yeah, good advice. Thanks, Mon thanks for the question, Monica. Um, Rob here said, we often see chameleons crossing the road in game reserves. Why do they move as the vegetation looks quite uniform on both sides and it doesn't look like they're following a female? Why did the chameleon cross the road <laughs> to get to the other side, <laughs> Rob, I think? <laughs> Look, uh, I guess this is probably up in like Lowfelt or something, you know, Kruger Park area, whatever. And it, I, I guess, I mean, I'm, I'm imagining from the, the description there. And uh, I think that the in that case, the trees are probably so, I can't really tell you why the chameleon crossed the road. <laughs> mm. There's trees here, there's trees there. They, they're probably going to cross the ground anyway to get to the next tree. And so it just so happens to be a road at that case. I, I can't give you a better explanation than that. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm sorry. That sounds plausible. Yeah, I hope that's okay, Rob. <laughs> um, uh, a question here from Marie is, how do they move around? And do they have ranges? So we know that, I mean, they would, do they, how and how, you know, how far, how big is it? Is it a traditional yeah. chameleon's range? That's kind of ties into Rob's question in a way, mm -hmm. I suppose. Um, so we have actually done some uh, radio tracking of chameleons. We have these teeny tiny, that big transmitters mm -hmm. that we can glue onto their side and um, then pick up the signal with a, a radio receiver and we can follow the chameleons. We've done that a few times now. And with the dwarf chameleons, we find they don't move very far. We also in that monitoring where we do the numbering of chameleons, we can find them night after night um, and they don't move very far. So the one study we did um, looked at sort of home ranges. <laughs> we had some chameleons that would in the morning start moving around, go off maybe 10 meters and come back to the very same bush to sleep night after night. So not a big home range. Although in that particular study, there was one female who a male tried to mate with her. She didn't want to have anything to do with him. She drove him off. And then the next day she took off. She was 300 meters away within less than 
you know, less than five days. So she she was like, I'm out of here. So I have a feeling from the observations and things that the home ranges are on a short scale, quite small, mm -hmm. but on a long scale. So if we're talking over a year, fluid. So that small range that they'd move day after day kind of over time changes and they might end up off over there somewhere six months later um, and perhaps come back again. But yeah, fluid in terms of the overall landscape, but small in terms of, you know, what happening that week. Right. So you can have the same chameleons in your garden day after day, but eventually mm -hmm. they'll go off somewhere else. In other words. Okay. Uh, just a follow-up from Monica was asking, what is the right time in the day to be a lookout for them? So assuming with they when they when they're using, when they're warming up. <laughs> so yeah, that whole camouflage thing is a problem <laughs> for the daytime. Mm. Our eyes really can't detect them in the day. You you may see a chameleon. Um, you I'm, I'm not saying you won't see them in the day, but they are very difficult to see in the day. When we are doing research projects on them, we find them at night. So we use a torch and we shine it into the bushes and you can see the, the sort of outline of the chameleon standing out against the darkened vegetation. And that's how we do it. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen chameleons in the day, but many more at night, many more. <laughs> Great. Hope that helps. Thank you. And then I've got one final question is um, when you when you categorize a species as vulnerable. So now the Grootvaarders boss is vulnerable in a four kilometer square, square, four square kilometer range. How many individuals that what, what what's what are the thresholds? Is it, oh. is it, and how do you know that there's that many species, that, that yeah. many individuals there? We, we're not able to count them. Chameleons obviously are very tricky to count because they're all up into the trees and everything. And you just never really it would take a lot of marking with numbers on their bellies and <laughs> and years to figure out exactly how many chameleons there are in a population. So for that particular chameleon, we had to use other uh, criteria besides population numbers. We used mm. the range size and the potential of um, is the forest disappearing all you know at, at one catastrophic effect. Uh, impact and not I'm not talking about a meteor or something you know just mm -hmm. something you know there's a change in land use and the forest all goes you know that can happen at once so we had to use these other kinds of categories where we didn't look at exact numbers but other sorts of features of threats to categorize that one if you're interested about that you can go to the IUCN red list website because there's mm -hmm. a lot of information there and it's uh, very helpful to to um get a, a better grip on what's mean, what it means. Oh, fantastic. Thank you so much, Crystal. Thank you. Right, that we come to the end of this this, this uh, month's talk. I want to thank uh, first of all, Crystal, for joining us today. And thank you all for joining us and listening to our talk. And we'll see you all in the first Wednesday of, can you believe it, November. <laughs> so, thanks, everybody. Keep well. Thank bye you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.